in legal affairs. And I'm Michael Scrotto, NHMC's Policy Council. Uh, together, Jessica and I comprise NHMC's DC office and policy shop. We're so excited to be honoring two outstanding public servants this evening, FCC Commissioners Michael Cox and Manuel Clyburn. And we're also thrilled to share with you <laughs> We're also thrilled to share with you our DC friends the ongoing work that NHMC has been doing across the country uh, to improve the image of Latinos in media, to increase employment equity for Latinos in the media and telecommunications industries, and to advocate for media and telecommunications policies that benefit the Latino community and other communities of color. But don't take my word for it. Please turn your attention to the screens up here, and there's one in the back, uh, and we'll look at a brief overview of NHMC's work over the past 25 years. with which everyone acted. We were all unpaid staff at the time. Everybody was volunteer. In pursuit of its mission for media equality, the group's strategy in its first 10 years was to file more than 100 petitions with the FCC to deny the renewal of licenses of television and radio stations nationwide. Picketing and boycotting was another key strategy. The way we got Howard Stern to back away from attacking Selena was by going after his advertisers. As a result of that, he not only stopped attacking Selena, but he actually apologized. In 1992, the coalition won another important victory. It negotiated with Univision to develop quality children's programming. Plaza Sesimo, Sesame Street in Spanish, made it to air. They resisted it. For months they resisted it because they didn't want to pay the licensing fees. In the end, what we are asking for is, in fact, what's good for everyone. It's good for the community, but it's also good for the stations. As the years progressed and the marketplace changed, the coalition redefined and reconfigured itself to expand its strategies to include the argument that Latino purchasing power, over $1 trillion today, cannot be ignored. So in 1999, when the coalition insisted the networks hire more Latinos and the networks didn't even want to meet with them, the coalition called for a national TV brownout. Shortly thereafter, an LA Times story reported that out of 26 new primetime network shows, there was not one single leading character of color. They have to be equitable with us. We want what is rightfully ours, a part of the American pie, a part of the media American pie. That same year, the coalition joined forces with the National Latino Media Council the NAACP, the Asian Pacific American Media Coalition, and the American Indians in Film and TV, and created the Multi-Ethnic Media Coalition, which signed historic memorandums of understanding with ABC, CBS, NBC, and Fox, all pledging to make their lineups and workforces more diverse. They had to bend to public pressure, to public scrutiny, to public condemnation, not only by Latinos, but others as well, who were saying the same thing. How can you keep a whole population excluded from programming from jobs? The Multi-Ethnic Media Coalition monitors the network's progress through annual report cards. However, progress has been slow and incremental. This year, the network failed us. When it came to Latinos, we were down. Still, the coalition continues to fight for representational parity across all media platforms. In 2004, they took on Nielsen for undercounting Latino viewers, which could have meant the cancellation of Latino-themed shows. But we won as well. We now have 
you know, very outstanding Latinos and Latinas in the hierarchy of Nielsen that are very sensitive to our needs that in fact are right there to make sure that Latinos are properly counted. That same year, in response to the continued lack of diverse writers in primetime network TV, the coalition created its television writing program in hopes that if there were more people of color at the writer's table, more diversity would be reflected on the small screen. We have now placed over 15 of those writers from this program. They're successful, they're out there, they're working. Meanwhile, the coalition is battling another important issue, minority media ownership. A recent study shows Latinos own less than 3% of radio stations and just over 1% of TV stations nationwide. So the group held hearings with FCC commissioners and testified before Congress arguing that the more media giants consolidate, the more diversity vanishes, and the prospect of minority media ownership disappears along with it. We have to have our own properties. In fact, we can hire, we can fire, we can put content on that is directed very specifically at our community. And that may happen if the memorandum of understanding recently signed between the coalition and Comcast and other Hispanic groups is adhered to. Comcast, which has acquired NBC Universal, is pledging to create four new Latino networks, and that may open up doors for Latino ownership. That is exactly what this is going to provide, a window to who the Latino community is and how creative we can be when given the opportunity. At a time when hate crimes against Latinos are at an all-time high, the coalition in 2007 launched an aggressive campaign against hateful speech on the airwaves. What jobs do the women and the children do that we have to have them here other than the children's job is to dumb down the American children and overpopulate our schools? It filed a petition for inquiry with the FCC to ask for an investigation into the connection between hate speech and hate crimes. But over two years later, nothing has been done. If you say a lie long enough, at a certain point people are going to believe it and act on that. If we don't raise our voices, if we don't raise our concerns, it'll keep on going. So the coalition partnered up with UCLA's Chicano Studies Research Center, which is currently conducting three reports examining hate crimes and hate speech. Two of those studies are done, and one more will be issued by this coming April. Today, the battle for media equality and fairness rage on such as it did under the leadership of the first chair, Armando Duron, the second chair, Esther Renteria, and Alex Nogales for the last 15 years. All agree there is further work still to do, but there is much to be proud of. The strides that we have made to uplift our community, we can't put a price on. And we weren't doing it for ourselves, we were doing it for the future. We were making a big difference in the lives not only of our peers, but also in terms of what was to be there for our children. Opportunity. been possible without the support of the National Association of Broadcasters. I'm very pleased to introduce our generous host and sponsor of this evening's events, Senator Gordon Smith, who is the president of the National Association of Broadcasters. I first met Senator Smith in a meeting about NHMC's campaign against hate speech and media, and I was moved by his sincerity and his dedication to working with us on this issue. NHMC is so pleased to count him as a friend. Senator Smith, everyone. Feels like church, everybody in the back. Uh, <laughs> I, I want you to know that um, what you saw there is makes us at NAB doubly grateful that you would come here and allow us to be your host. We want you to feel at home. We're forced, so thankful that you're present with us, and I hope that your presence here uh, represents uh, what you receive from us 
is a whole lot of goodwill to make sure that what the video we show in the future shows progress that we're making together. And so we're very, very thankful that there's such a great turnout and that you're with us. And uh, this is uh, the National Hispanic Media Coalition's 25th anniversary impact rewards, awards reception. And I want to, I'm going to do some reading here because I want to make sure I get everybody recognized that should be. I noticed uh, Commissioner Clyburn's father, uh, Congressman Clyburn, uh, came in. Congressman, are you still here? There he is, right in the back. Uh, I know Congressman Clyburn uh, well from my years on the Hill, and um, there are few, few voices that are uh, more powerful for minority issues than Congressman Clyburn, and we're so, so grateful for his presence here today. And I want to give special rec uh, a special welcome to uh, NHMC's leadership. It's President and CEO Alex Nogales. Alex, where are you at? Raise your hand. There you are. Hi, Alex. It's Executive Vice President I Inez uh, Gonzalez. Uh, there's Inez. And their Vice, Vice President of Policy and Legal Affairs, Jessica Gonzalez. Where's Jessica? We deeply appreciate uh, NHMC's efforts to increase diversity in broadcast, radio, and television. And I will admit to you, we have, we have room for improvement, as you saw in that video. And I want you to know that broadcasters are telling me to put the, put the pressure on to make sure that we, uh, we do a better job of, of sensitivity to all the diversity that there is in America. And there are a few communities more important to America's future than the Hispanic community. And during the last year, uh, NHMC and NAB have worked diligently to have the, an ongoing dialogue, a dialogue that frankly was not, um, uh, frankly, much existent before this last year. Um, because there are few constituencies that are, are bigger users of broadcast airwaves than the Hispanic community. Uh, Alex and his team uh, uh, have been wonderful to work with and have received our hand of welcome very warmly. And we thank you, Alex, for the way in which we find we're able to work with you. Your team is accomplished, committed, tireless consumer advocates, and we're grateful for the opportunity as broadcasters to partner with them. I also want to welcome uh, a very good friend of mine, Bert Gomez. Bert, are you here from Univis? There's Bert back there. Uh, they got, a, they got a franchise player at, at Univision, uh, my friend Bert Gomez. He is just a, a wonderful and powerful voice on Capitol Hill. And uh, I'm, I feel very fortunate to, to count him as my friend. Um, we appreciate his commitment to serving Hispanic communities across America. And uh, he's just one of the hardest peop working people in town. Tonight's uh, is a celebration um, that broadcasters need to be a part of. And I want to take a minute to share our congratulations to two of our FCC commissioners who are with us this evening. Uh, Manon Clyburn, no, uh, where is she? She's, I, she looks lovely. Have you seen her dress? Uh, she always looks lovely, but I, I hope you're going to a, a really neat party afterwards, too. Uh, you didn't need to dress up for me, uh, Commissioner. Um, and of course, uh, Michael Copps um, is here as well. Commissioner Copps, I have known Commissioner Copps for many, many years when I served on the Senate Commerce Committee. And uh, while he and I probably have a political issue different here or there, I have found few people with uh, more fun to be with, welcoming. And uh, I, I'm just really grateful uh, that as you're official career comes to an end that you would spend this evening with us, Michael. You're just a, a real champion and we're honored that um, uh, you're passionate about broadcasting and have been for so many years. Commissioner Clyburn, as many of you know, spent an impressive 14 years as publisher and general manager of the Coastal Times, a family-founded weekly newspaper in the Charleston, South Carolina area that focused primarily on issues affecting the African-American community. So as a former journalist, uh, broadcasters consider you uh, one of us. So uh, thank you. We salute you, Commissioner Clyburn. Commissioner Michael Copps has been an outspoken advocate for broadcasting issues during his 10 years of service at the FCC. 
And even though we don't always agree, as I said, his service and commitment to our industry are absolutely undeniable. In an interview published today, he said, quote, I love broadcasters. I hope a lot of them like me. I hope they understand that I think broadcasting fulfills a vital function in this democracy. The flame of the public interest burns brightly in their hearts, and they can do much good, end of quote. Well, as the spokesman for the NAB, Commissioner Copps, I want to say for the record, we like you. <laughs> And we know that you'll continue your, your interest in the vitality and longevity of the broadcasting industry. And you will be missed in your official capacity, sir. But we hope you will not be a stranger at this, in this building and on our issues. And so we thank you uh, deeply for all you have done for our country and for the great, in, the great interest of, of telecommunications in America. Well, this is a critical time for broadcasters and the Hispanic and Spanish-speaking viewers. More than 23 percent, that's nearly a quarter of all Hispanic households, rely exclusively on over-the-air television. One of the biggest challenges we face and a concern we share with NHMC is increasing minority ownership in broadcasting. And in fact, one of the first things I did when I came to the NAB was to go to the FCC and to advocate for the reinstatement of the Minority Tax Certificate Program, when in effect the program provided tax deferrals on capital gains earned through the sale of media properties to minority buyers. Congress eliminated the program in the mid-1990s, and for the record, that was before I got on the Commerce Committee or on the Senate Finance Committee, but uh, it was an enormously effective program. I wish we'd have adopted President Clinton's uh, line on other programs, mend it, don't end it. We needed to amend it because where there were abuses, fine, fix them. But in fact, they advanced tremendously uh, minority ownership in broadcasting. In the 17 years that the FCC's minority tax certificate policy was in effect, from 1978 to 1995, the scant minority ownership of broadcast properties multiplied. The policy produced 364 tax certificates and 200 media transactions, totaling more than $1 billion in value. That represented about two-thirds of all minority-owned stations. When the policy began, Minority-owned stations owned about 40 of 8,500 stations. 40 out of that many. Over its lifetime, the policy helped raise that number to 300 and uh, to 330 um, and 290 radio stations and 43 TV stations, and also yielded 31 uh, cable systems. I see Kyle McSclero here, and I'm sure he's going to celebrate that with me. But why would we want to renew it now? Because diversity program has never been more important, and new incentive policy is a proven way to increase diversity of ownership, which is linked to program diversity. And because the continuing reliance by Americans on broadcasting for news and entertainment in the face of competition from multiple newer technologies, this requires that the underrepresentation of citizens historically excluded from station ownership be corrected. At NAB, we believe that now is the time to reinstate the Minority Tax Certificate Program and once again lower barriers, barriers to entry for minorities and become business owners in our industry. I would also point out as we have seen uh, different minority networks develop through the multicasting made possible for the digital age. This is a huge opportunity to find new entry points, affordable entry points for uh, Hispanic, African American, Native American um, networks that could develop and find a foothold into the broadcast industry. The future of broadcast TV and radio are bright. Um, as Mark Twain said, the reports of my demise are premature. Uh, 
Broadcast radio and television are very healthy industries and they, their future looks healthier still because of the opportunities in the digital age. And so we look forward to working with uh, NHMC to ensure that Hispanic and Spanish-speaking communities receive all the wonderful opportunities and choices being offered through their local stations as well as benefit, the benefit that will come from future innovations. So thank you for your presence here. I accept, uh, welcome you, uh, not just because we're grateful that you would come to this broadcast facility um, based on the problems that have existed in the past, but I see your presence here today as a challenge to all of us for the future. And so that next time we run a video, it can be about all the progress we've made and all the minority ownership that exists so that broadcasting, America's airways, are truly re reflective of all the diversity that makes us the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Smith, for your remarks and your hospitality this evening and for your legacy of service to the Latino community. We have one other reception sponsor that we'd like to recognize this evening before we get to our honorees. We would like to extend our appreciation to Comcast NBC Universal for its continued support of NHMC's programs to increase Latino representation in the media industry. Please welcome Comcast's Executive Director of Diversity and Inclusion, Maria Arias. Good evening and congratulations to tonight's honorees. Buenas noches a todos y felicidades a los que estamos festejando. Comcast is a proud sponsor of the National Hispanic Media Coalition's 25th Anniversary Impact Awards, largely because we share kindred mission. And that mission is to improve the diversity and inclusion of Latinos in all facets of the media industry. From network ownership opportunities to hiring and promoting individuals in front and behind the camera, to offering digital literacy courses to low-income households in 39 states and in the District of Columbia and providing internet access. Comcast and NBC Universal are committed to driving initiatives that promote and impact Latinos in our communities. We'd like to thank Alex Nogales, president of the NHMC and a member of our Comcast NBC Universal Joint Diversity Advisory Council for inviting us to sponsor this terrific event tonight, honoring our two trailblazers, Commissioner Clyburn and Commissioner Copps, whose efforts continue to empower Latinos both within the United States and across the Latin diasporas. Muchísimas gracias. In just a few months, we will celebrate the one year anniversary of bringing NBC Universal into the Comcast family. And we are very proud to be one of the world's leading media, entertainment, and communications companies. We operate entertainment and news networks, NBC and Telemundo broadcast networks, local television stations, major motion studio, theme parks, and a major company. As a new expanded media company, we not, we not only want to deliver the best content, entertainment services, we also have a renewed commitment to diversity and inclusion for all people of color. This year, we made a number of significant advancements specific to the Latino community, and I'd like to name just a few. For the first time ever, we now have a Latino on the Comcast Corporation Board of Directors, Eduardo Mestre, who was appointed in May. We hired Ruben Mendiola recently as the new Vice President of Multicultural Video Services at Comcast Cable. We hired Emilio Romano as the President of Telemundo and the cable channel Mundos. We promoted Natalie Morales to co-anchor the Today Show. And earlier this year, Anton Safuentes, who's here with us tonight, was named Washington Bureau Chief. We have made it a priority to promote, hire, and develop Latinos across our companies. On the programming side, most relevant tonight, we have expanded our distribution of nine programming services to 17 million subscribers. We launched Xfinity TV en Español with over 500 programming choices. And over the next eight years, we will launch 10 new independent networks, four of which will be owned 
or operated by Latinos. I can say firsthand, as a Latina and as an executive who drives diversity initiatives across our company every day, that we are proud to align with the NHMC tonight. Your mission, your leadership, and your advocacy helps propel success in our Latino community. Congratulations again, Commissioner Clyburn and Commissioner Cox, and thank you again to the board of the NHMC for inviting us to sponsor this very important event tonight. Thank you. Thank you to, to Maria and Comcast NBC Universal for their ongoing efforts to diversify their workforces. And to all of this evening's sponsors, I'd like to extend a heartfelt gratitude from the entire NHMC team. Now, I have to admit, it's not always easy to be one of NHMC's corporate sponsors. Sometimes we disagree on core issues, and those entities that sponsor us have done so unconditionally and unselfishly, teaching us the virtue of disagreeing without being disagreeable. Along with the NAB and Comcast NBC Universal, our reception sponsors this evening, we would also like to thank our gold sponsors, Sprint and Cricket Communications, for their generous support. Please give all of our sponsors a round of applause. Now for the moment we've all been waiting for, honoring our outstanding public servants. First, I'd like to introduce Commissioner Mignon Clyburn. Commissioner Clyburn was appointed to her current post by President Obama in 2009, arriving in DC by way of South Carolina like a breath of fresh air. At the point of her arrival, NHMC had witnessed the comings and goings of many FCC commissioners, many of them incredibly devoted to public service but none quite like Commissioner Clyburn. This commissioner is not the typical government bureaucrat. In her time <laughs> at the commission, she has demonstrated that she understands how policies made inside the Beltway impact people of all walks of life outside the Beltway. She has paid special attention to the needs of those who have been under and misrepresented in mainstream media. She has demonstrated courage under fire in many contentious FCC proceedings, all that have occurred during her short tenure at the FCC. She has always made time to hear from the little guys and not just the rich and the powerful. And she has raised the voices of communities of color on a number of pressing issues that will impact how we exchange stories and information in the digital age. For all of these reasons and so much more, she is so deserving of NHMC's Impact Award for outstanding commitment to serving the public interest. Thank you, Commissioner, for all that you do, and please kind of come on up here to accept your award. Good evening, everyone. I uh, thank you so much, Jessica, for that very warm and generous uh, introduction. And one of my favorite people, Alex Nogales. Number one, I just love saying his name. <laughs> it's, just, it's just as melodic as he is. I just love it. Um, for your commitment to, uh, to public service and for your bravery and willingness to say exactly what needs to be said, no matter how difficult and no matter how challenging. We all benefit, and we thank you so much uh, for being you. Just, uh, Senator Smith and Ms. Arias, uh, thank you so much for your support and sponsorship, and for my friend, uh, Commissioner Copps. This is going to be a difficult few weeks for me uh, to officially say goodbye to a person I refer to as my favorite professor. And I say that because, number one, he is professorial, uh, but number two, when he opens his mouth to speak, literally, there's a hush over the room. Everyone listens, everyone respects, and everyone learns from the engagement. And yes, Senator Smith, we might not agree on every syllable, but from my perspective, most syllables I embrace, 
and I am going to miss him officially. But I told him even though he's going to retire from the commission, he's not going to retire from me. So I'm looking <laughs> forward to, uh, to that engagement and continuing this commitment to diversity in this space. The senator said it best that it is so important for the images of all individuals to be reflected as fairly and as robustly and as openly as possible. We have been shortchanged over the years, but your commitment here tonight affirms that there is hope for change. And I commit to you that this award is a down payment on my commitment to be a change agent, to be your partner, to do what it takes from the boardroom to the control room, to do exactly what needs to be done to green light more projects, because that is what it's going to take to ensure that the images that we know make our community so great are on the big screens and on the small screens of America. So I want to thank you for this award. I want to thank you for encouraging me to keep going. I want to thank you for you to keep going. Because it's not easy. You could have given up a long time ago. There are a lot easier roads to travel. When we talk about commitment to diversity, when we talk about promoting the images that we know we so deserve to witness. It's going to be met with resistance. There will be a lot of reasons why it's not considered profitable, why the scales and scope, all of these economies of this and that, um, that can't be realized because this budget needs to be this and it has to uh, uh, gross hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars before it's profitable. We cannot settle for that. We know that the most diverse products, the most diverse entities, are the most profitable in this nation, and we have to continue to remind those green lighters that we know that, and we expect that to be reflected in the images, in the hiring practices, and in the products that it deliver. Thank you so much for this award. Everybody. I'm Alex Nogales, the President and CEO of the National Hispanic Media <clears throat> Coalition. And Commissioner Clyburn, I have a story. <laughs> Is your dad still here? Oh, yes, because he's my ride. <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you that we went to see the congressman. And you know, this is a tough guy. He doesn't give too much of himself to a conversation. And we were discussing Hayes Beach, and we were discussing many other issues and he just had a straight face and I didn't know how the conversation was going. I didn't know if he was with us, against us, neutral, I didn't know anything. And then I said to him, you know, and your daughter is one of our champions at the FCC. And that was it. Big smile like this. <laughs> and thereafter we were like great friends. <laughs> Tremendous influence that you have. Um, I asked to present this particular award, and I did for a lot of different reasons. Um, first and foremost, because I will really miss Commissioner Cobb's presence at the FCC. In fact, although I was pleased to see the nominations of the two FCC commissioners, as I was looking at or the two new FCC commissioners coming in, so I was looking at their fresh faces in a news article last week. It occurred to me that once Commissioner Cobbs leaves, I'll have no one my age to visit when I go to the FCC. Seriously, however, this man leaves a legacy of dedication to public interest values that goes unmatched by any FCC commissioner. 
Without a doubt, he will go down as the single greatest FCC commissioner in history. For years, this commissioner has stunned us with his resolve, entertained us with his cheeky public statements, and won us over with his deep devotion to enhancing democracy over our media systems. Commissioner Cobbs has made it his business to examine the impacts of the FCC de de uh, decisions, excuse me, on communities of color and the poor. He has been a great leader and a great friend. Commissioner Cobbs joined the FCC in 2001 this year. His term expires and it is with heavy hearts that we wish him well in his next steps. And I was speaking to him just shortly before we got started. And I was concerned that he was just gonna leave and that would be all we saw of him. But he assured me that that was not going to be the case, that he will continue to be active in these matters that are so important to not only one ethnic group, but to the entire nation. The least that we can do is honor him with the H and HMC Impact Award for Lifetime Achievement in Public Service. Commissioner Copps, will you please come up? After all of those nice remarks, the best thing I could probably do would be to shut up and, <laughs> and sit down but with an audience like this. I can't, re I can't resist. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Gordon Smith, for opening your association headquarters up to uh, us tonight. Thank you, Leader Clyburn, for being here. And Can you drop me off at the FCC? <laughs> <laughs> thank you to my Colleague Mignon, wouldn't even try uh, with the beauty and the elegance and the eloquence of your of your presentation. What a tremendous colleague you are, and uh, it makes me a lot more comfortable in leaving the FCC to know that I'm leaving it in such capable hands to push things forward. And I guess I'd put the emphasis, I'm just kind of thinking that loud here, on push things forward. <laughs> we really have a lot of work to do, and happy anniversary to Alex and, uh, and the group here for everything you have done, and we've done a lot together, we've been on the road together, we've done hearings together, we have heard from America all across America, we continue to do this, Mignon and I were in Atlanta just a couple of nights ago with the help of uh, Congressman John Lewis uh, to hear about media down there. And we still have a long way to go. And I do love broadcasting. And I do love broadcasters. And in many of them, the flame of the public interest still burns in their breasts. And I so much admire that because so much resides on how they perform going ahead. Because it's from your broadcast newsroom and from the newspaper newsrooms that we still get, that America still gets 90 or 95 percent of its news and information. There's just less of it than there used to be and we have to find a way to reverse it. And we have to bring it about with really a sense of urgency. I saw that urgency in Atlanta last week when uh, a lot of minority groups stepped up to the table and said, you know, we, we're not getting covered. Our positive contributions to this society are not being heard. There's too much a caricature. And again, it's not by any means a majority of broadcasters, but there's just a modus operandi, whatever you want to call it, it's just the, the, the financial system expects different things of us all now. 
And you guys really got to help get us out of that. It's stakeholders, and we're all stakeholders, and this room is full of stakeholders and people representing millions and millions of Americans. And that trumps stockholders, and for many times in our history, it did. That's how we built this country, with that dedication to the public interest. And I feel it more and more, maybe it's just because I'm getting ready to leave, or maybe because it's, the problem is getting worse, but we got a country that's got some really great big problems to face right now. And I think they go in severity back to some of the problems we had in the 1930s. Where is the future of the economy? How do you build those jobs back? How do you get unemployment down? How do you create opportunity? How do you get America's competitiveness back in the international arena? How do we insure the uninsured in health? How do we straighten out our education? Really serious challenges that go to the whole viability of our, of our country. And it's a story that's got to be told. So we're looking to you, and we're looking to all of us, we're looking to everybody in this room, to make it happen now. And there's so much power, there's so much influence, there's so much ability to do good in this room right now. And I look forward, I'm leaving the FCC, but as uh, Alex noted, I'm not leaving those issues. I couldn't leave these issues if I could. But I think we have a moment, not much more, but I think we have a moment to do something about it and to really tee the issues up and to let the American people know what's really going on in this country uh, right now, to dig for the facts, to bring journalism back, and then you can count, I think, on the American people to make the right decisions for the future of their country. But if you deny them that breadth or depth of news and information they need, it's not going to happen. This is not a 21st century problem. This is not something that has just recently happened. That's always been the challenge of democracy. How do you keep your people informed? How do you build information infrastructure? And we've always found a way. You go back and look at George Washington, James Madison, Thomas Jefferson. They, they talked about this 200 and some years ago. We just went through the Revolutionary War. We created this young country. Can it survive? This is one hell of an experiment here. It's never been tried before. How are we going to make it endure? Well, they wrote the First Amendment to make sure there was freedom of speech. And these very same people who wrote the First Amendment then said, we got to get the news out. So what did they do? They subsidized newspapers. They built postal roads. And newspapers of all different varieties of opinion go out. And they were willing to take their chance on that, and they were willing to bet the future of America on that. And that was the same theory with broadcasting. The use of the people's airwaves to inform and to serve the public interest. And a lot of, a lot of folks do that. But we're really, really dependent upon it. So what I'm hoping to do I love this lifetime achievement, but my lifetime is not quite over yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's to really kind of make this happen, and I see a lot of our friends from public interest groups in the crowd tonight, and I think 40 years in this town have finally educated me. I'm a very slow learner, I think. But while good change can come from the top down, real change comes from the bottom up, and it comes from the grassroots up. And we all need to dedicate ourselves to that because it's a moment of real challenge for the future of the country. But I have, I have been honored for 10 years to serve in this position. I think the FCC is a great organization. It's an organization of excellence. I think Chairman Janikowski is making it even more of an organization of excellence that's capable of doing uh, great, great good. We've got to value that. There's a lot of countries that don't have that. A lot of countries where just the edict comes down from the minister or the president or something. There's no independent agency. There's nobody seeking the input of the people. So you've got to nourish that. And you've got to make sure that all of those people have the opportunity for input. So it's not just a few who are lucky enough to have 
lobbyists and lawyers and people representing them, but so the people in the disabilities communities, the, the people on the native lands in the country, all of the minorities are so woefully unrepresented. They have got to be a part of this if we're ever going to step up to the challenges facing the country, and I better shut up now before I go into a longer speech. But, but I do feel that sense of urgency about it, and that's why I'm going to stay involved in speaking about these issues. I hope all of you do, too. I know you will. I look forward to uh, continuing, uh, not only working with you, but there's wonderful friends in this room, and I, I so much appreciate the opportunity to uh, uh, ha have enjoyed your friendship over the recent years and, and to continue your friendship. So uh, I guess at this time we should kind of close with uh, maybe Tiny Tim and the Christmas Carol when he said, God bless us all. God bless us, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Commissioner Copps. Uh, folks, that concludes our remarks here this evening. Thanks to all of you that have made this event possible. Please stick around for a while to mingle. Happy holidays to all. Buenas noches a todos. Gracias.